our winners finals. These players have made it so far in the tournament and they've just got a couple of games to go. It's going to be the Spectria and the Amoongus coming out on one side. We've got the Regieleki and the Urshifu there on the field as well. So David really leading out with that Regieleki. Delighted to see it. But Urshifu there as well. That can be a lot of trouble for that Spectria. Yeah, and this is a smart lead from David because, you know, the one thing if you've got Reggie Gigas is the, the problem would be if you saw the Spectre lead from Jean-Paul and that's probably what he expected was that the Ghost typing kind of makes you immune to those max strikes. So putting on pressure straight away with a really good choice here from the Urshifu and uh, the Reggie Lecky supporting it as well is a, a really good option, you know, being able to get damage and do some big work against that Amoongus and the supporting Pokemon here. Yeah, Spectria known as a really speedy Pokemon, so being able to lower the speed is really key there for David. Amoongus, however, going to have to take that Wicked Glow, of course, going to be a critical hit as Spectria is able to fire off a Mud Shot, so going to go into the Urshifu, do a little bit of damage, but again, lower the speed here. So Regieleki going to be the fastest thing on the field and the Urshifu taking that sport as well from the Amoongus. You know, Urshifu not able to pick up that critical KO and we've seen that Amoongus from John Paul do a lot of disruption with that sport. Yeah, and again, we're seeing how well it's been trained, you know? You think because of the, the, the initial damage from the Electro Web there, it'd be enough to put it in range, but still no, it's still <laughs> standing strong on the field. And now Jean-Paul's got access to switch it out and, and, and re get the regenerator ability active to get some HP back to utilize it later. Um, and bringing a really nice switch in here, immune to the, the Regilecki and starting to put, you know, a little bit more pressure on the board from his side of the field. Yeah, I like this turn here by Jean-Paul. Like you said, um, Lander is not going to worry about it and Urshifu is guaranteed to take that turn of sleep so it's a really safe switch in there for the Landorus. Spectre of course going to be able to survive another one of those Electra webs even though it is at minus two speed doesn't have to worry about the Urshifu due to the sleep it's able to go for a Nuller mud shot and just keep reducing the speed of this Urshifu going forward while also dealing some substantial damage really putting it in good range for this Landorus. Yeah, and if the lander is now, you know, Jean-Paul might want to yeah, go for his, his Dynamax turn here because he's got the opportunity with the lander at speeding that Urshifu to get an airstream off. It's not affected by anything that the Regieleki is doing, especially if it's locked into that Electro Web. We don't know quite yet, but uh, the Spectre is definitely in a little bit of a bad position. So, you know, if Jean-Paul wants to preserve that for later on, may want to switch the Amoongus back in, soak up those Electro type attacks and get that max airstream off. And at the same time, you're giving Amoongus a speed boost as well, which can really benefit you if you really want to disrupt a little bit further with those spores going into the rest of this battle. Exactly. The Amoongus, like you said, the regenerability is going to give it a little bit extra HP to come back in later on as Regieleki just goes straight for the Thunderbolt there into the Spectre and is able to pick up the KO. Um, you know, it remained untouched from those um, mob bombs there. So Lander is here going to be able to go for the Earthquake as well. Going to be able to pick up the KO against both of David's Pokemon here. Regieleki, never really the best Pokemon to try and take any ground type moves at the best of times. And the depleted HP from that Urshifu really putting it in prime range. And Landorus, you know, with the Life Orb there as well, dealing that extra damage, really has come on as a formidable force on the field. But David does have another strategy he can go for in his last two remaining Pokemon. That Venusaur and Torkoal combination will really throw the speed back into David's favor with the sun being on the field Venusaur is going to be very very happy about this yeah definitely and this is a combination that you really want to take advantage of here uh, if, if you are David you know the, the sun being upset with the talk hall putting a lot of pressure on to both Pokemon on Jean Paul's side of the field you know and, and definitely now with the Venusaur the ability to take advantage through the with its chlorophyll ability doubling its speed going to get the jump now on Lander Asterion and uh, it does have to be careful of course about the max airstream and uh, has the big question is has Venusaur got enough to um, actually Ooh. take down the Lander or the sleep powder there is so big pivotal miss there unfortunately oh i mean it had a way to stop it right in its tracks with that sleep powder but does avoid the landorus that also jumps out of the action with that fly up into the skies torkoal is going to have to take a nap with the amoongus outspeeding it here and being able to put it to sleep with a spore but crucially here neither of these trainers have used their dynamax as of yet lee no, not yet. And um, that, you know, they're both being very patient with when they're wanting to do that. But I think David's kind of hand is being forced a little bit because, you know, there's only he's only got two Pokemon left. There's only a certain amount of time that he's going to be able to utilize this. The lander is on Jean Paul's side, going for that fly the previous turn. It's really playing into his advantage here because the thing is, the Venusaur now is going to attack before the lander is, and you're going to waste the turn. Mm -hmm. So, does David 
just go for a protect here if he's got it or does he actually go for the gigantamax and and then try and get some damage onto maybe something like the amoogus here get uh max uh, ooze off get a special attack boost to help boost the um the tall call so if you can get an early wake up or one turn wake up you can get some big damage off and really maybe even clear the field from the amoogus it's super effectively weak to the fire type attacks and the land risk that'll drop down from that fly yeah, you're right there. You know, the speed tier is kind of working against Davido, but he's actually going to go for that max guard. Landorus going for the fly into the Venusaur would have been able to deal a good chunk of damage, but David using one of those max turns to guarantee the protection for his Venusaur. Torkoal is going to have to take the pollen puff there. Really not going to deal too much. Torkoal doesn't mind taking that. But the critical thing here is that Landorus is now back down into the action. Venusaur, of course, can outspeed, go for something like a G-Max Vine Lash and start getting that residual damage going onto the field and targeting down into that Landorus. But Jean-Paul does, of course, still have access to his Dynamax as well. Yeah, that's the big thing. Like the Landorus can go for its Dynamax this turn if you feel, and then if there's even the play where you could go for the Max Guard here, and then you're wasting almost two turns of that Gigantamax Venusaur. And um, but then if you do that, you've kind of got, still got to get round that final turn of the G Max Vine Lash, which is going to only, almost guaranteed to get off. And then you're staggering out the the residual damage, which you probably don't want to do if you're Jean Paul, and you want to just have that immediate impact as soon as possible, as well as the Torkoal. You know, it's not going to stay asleep forever, so you want to try and get some damage onto the things are on David's side of the field whilst you can, especially after that max guard the last turn. Well, Venusaur not protecting this time, going straight for the G-Max Vine Lash into the Landorus. Does a decent chunk of damage, but thanks to the double HP stat from the Dynamax, that Landorus is easily going to be able to take that and fire off a Max Airstream in retaliation. Goes into the Venusaur, does a huge chunk of damage, taking it down to that one HP. Thanks to the um, Focus Sash on the Venusaur. A really critical item. I know you touched on that yesterday, Lee, how it was a really interesting choice on Venusaur. We don't see it as often anymore, but certainly really working out here for David. Amoongus going to go for that Pollen Puff, however, and, you know, the glory that happened there for that uh, Venusaur with the Focus Sash is no more. So John Paul's been able to remove it from the field. Little Torkoal here now has a really big challenge ahead of it, particularly when you're facing down against a Landorus that can just hit you with something like a Max Quake. Yeah, it's really kind of the, the game is in Jean-Paul's hands now. There's not really very much David can do. And again, you, you, we've seen the, how well he's utilizing that Amoongus. Uh, really disruptive from the start here, you know, taking that that combination of attacks from the Regieleki and the Urshifu, shutting that down and then positioning himself really well with the Landorus, being very patient as well uh, with it when he wants to, in terms of Dynamaxing, and then going for it at the perfect time and taking down the Venusaur. And that's pretty much the end game there. So um, it was a very kind of one-sided battle there. There and we saw, you know, I think if you're going into game two, you're really going to have to look at ways to shut down the Amoongus if you have David because that was the big kind of Pokemon from Jean Paul's side of the field that was the, the, the key to the success in that one. Exactly, Amoongus doing what it does best and really disrupting the opponent's strategy there, putting lots of Pokemon to sleep. But critically, I think removing that Urshifu threat from the field, you know, being able to survive the double up, like you mentioned, from Regieleki and the Urshifu just allowed it to put Urshifu to sleep. The speed was constantly being lowered on it as well by the Spectre that just allowed the pass to be carved for Landorus to come in and pick up those really solid KOs. You know, the Max Airstream getting that same type of attack bonus as well through a Dynamax with a Life Orb. That's just something that's going to deal a huge chunk of damage. And you saw how much it did to that Venusaur in Dynamax as well. Yeah, that's the thing, you know. And like, if you're if you're David, then maybe even thinking about, well, that lead wasn't the worst lead in the world. I could go for that mm. lead again. But this time, rather than go for the Electro Web, that didn't really get me much of an advantage in that situation let's go for maybe a more powerful electro type attack just to get because you only needed a tiny bit more damage onto that amoongus for the wicked blow to pick up the knockout and if you can do that you can secure that knockout early on that's a very good trade at that point of the game because then you've got no worries about the sleep disruption going further into the game the other option is of course he does have that reggie gigas and mm -hmm. the wheezing combination that we could see here like you said you've seen in many times before the max strike combination to lower the speed of opposing pokemon and and then take advantage with a taunt from the wheezing potentially onto the Moongus that shuts it down completely. So that is an option as well and something maybe David is looking at going into this next one. Yeah, well, let's jump right into game two and maybe see if that Regigigas will make an appearance. Like you said, it's got a lot of versatility. Even something like a G-Max Hailstorm will be able to apply a lot of pressure to the Amoongus and the Landorus too. But it's going to be a lead out of the Amoongus and the Spectria on John Paul's side of the field. And Regieleki and Urshifu will be there for David. So no changes so far, Lee. No changes at all on the field and going for the same thing again from both players. And, you know, like what we just mentioned as well, 
is David thinking about going for that little bit of a more powerful attack into the Amoongus to remove it as quick as he can? Um, and it, is Jean Paul thinking that's my <laughs> that is what possibly could happen? Could we get maybe a lander a switch in here or just a you know, you can't protect in front of Urshifu. That's the that's the key here. You can't protect because of that unseen fist ability. So you're kind of stuck here and, and hoping that uh, David doesn't double in with that big attack. But as we're seeing, Lou, it's kicking off. <laughs> Yeah, Reggie Lecky needed that little bit of extra damage, so going for the Thunderbolt is going to be able to give the edge over that Amoongus. Mudshot going to come out once again, connect onto the Urshifu and just lower the speed, but not enough to stop it from moving first before that Amoongus with the Wicker Blow. Of course, the guaranteed critical hit here as well is enough to pick up the KO against the Amoongus, and Divi can breathe a sigh of relief as he doesn't have to worry about that pesky mushroom anymore going forward in this game too. Yeah, and that's a that's a big turn there for David, you know, taking down the Amoongus, we've seen how disruptive it can be, how much of a, a thorn in uh, David's side it was in that game one, and removing it turn one is just the best thing he can hope for. Now he doesn't lose his Urshifu, his Urshifu is still intact. It is minus one speed after the mud shot, so you've got to bear that in mind, but I mean, he can still switch it out, preserve it for later on, and still pressure that Spectre with something like, you know, uh, the, the Wicked Blow if he decides to go for it, but it is under a bit of pressure from the Landorus here that can go for the Dynamax this turn and also pick up a quick knockout onto the Urshifu here with a max airstream and, and take a big advantage quite quickly. So momentum can swing. I think both players need to uh, really address the, the threats in front of them and Urshifu probably wants to exit the field here whether or not David wants to bring in something like Torkoal to maybe soak up a little bit of damage if that's what he's got in the back like he had in game one. Um, and then does Jean Paul maybe like pick up on that and uh, go for maybe Max Quake, get some special defensive boost as well but I think the priority is always going to be the max airstream because if that Venusaur comes back onto the field you need to be and want to be faster than it when it does. That's very true. You've really got to consider your stats. So Urshifu leaving the field to reset that attack and speed drop that it got in that sort of turn one and then with the lander switching, I think is going to be critical here for David. And although Torkoal might be coming in and having to take a big chunk of damage for its efforts, it has done the critical thing of setting up that sun. So when Venusaur comes in, it's going to be able to have that speed ready for its chlorophyll ability to activate. But an interesting change of Dynamax here. It's actually going to be the Spectria for Jean-Paul. The lander is not going to be able to go for any max airstreams on this occasion. Reggie Alecki going for a Thunderbolt though, and you can see it does a huge chunk of damage, about a third to that Spectria, but Spectria able to retaliate with a Max Quake going down into that Torkoal that switched into the field. It is, however, able to survive on 27 HP, so unless Landorus has doubled up into it, it's going to be able to hang around at the end of this turn. However, the special defense going up is going to be unfortunate when you consider the Pokemon that David has got here, other than the Urshifu, the predominantly special attackers, so that's a calculation David has to bear in mind as he goes forward in terms of how much damage he's going to be capable of dealing out. Rock Slide comes out, though, Torkoal once again, just showing its really impressive defense stat off here, able to survive on 5 HP, and Reggie Alecki able to take that as well. Yeah, and you, you kind of think if you're Jean-Paul, maybe, oh, it's, it's a shame that I missed out on the talk call, but this actually plays into your hands a little bit better because you don't really want the Urshifu returning to the field and putting on any sucker punch pressure potentially to the Spectre here, especially when you pair that up with the Reggie Alecki. And now with that special defense boost, like you've just mentioned, Lou, you're in a real good position to maybe pick up the knockout onto Reggie Alecki, get another special defense boost as well as just maybe pivot out the Landris with something like a U-turn if he's got it here, just to pick up that knockout and help you kind of reposition for the next turn. Well, Lander is going to get off the field and you'll be very happy, Lee, to see that Galarian Moltres enter the field. As the Glastria decides to go straight for a Max Guard here, just wants to protect itself from anything this Reggie Lecky can throw at it. You can see it was the Electro of as well, so Spectria just wanting to keep its speed intact. Moltres, however, not so lucky, but the switch in from John Paul is going to benefit, however, as the weakness policy is going to be able to activate, boosting up that special attack and attack for the Moltres. Yawn's going to come out from the Torkoal here, connecting onto the Moltres that's come in. So although it has got the boosts, John Paul's now in an awkward position where on the next turn, that Moltres will be falling asleep if he doesn't switch it out. But if you switch it out, you lose the boosts. Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's not ideal, really. I think Jean-Paul thinking that probably another Thunderbolt going to come up, but, you know, David being a little bit smarter there, thinking maybe this is the point where a switch could come and whatever he's got in the back, we want to try and keep the speed advantage as best as possible. And also, check the Spectre's speed as well. We don't want to allow it getting, you know, taking advantage and being the fastest thing on the field, especially if the sun runs out, because you lose Toll Call at this point, then you are just relying on those raw speed stats. So this is another thing that David's can kind of considering, but doing all the right things to stall out these Dynamax turns from Jean-Paul's side of the field. 
Well, Jean-Paul staying in with the Moltres, knowing that it could survive another one of those electro webs, taking it down below 50%, activates that Berserk ability as well. Reggie Alecki, however, will be KO'd from the Max Phantasm coming out from that opposing um, Spectre here, going to be lowering the defense on that tall call as well. But, you know, doesn't have a lot of HP left anyway. I'm sure it would go down to one little hit there. But the special attack of the Spectria rising as well. Moltres is able to go for that fiery wrath connecting onto tall call and just blows it away right back into the Pokeball. Yeah, and th with that, he clears the field and defeated side of the field. But uh, unfortunately, that is the last turn for um, the, the, the the Dynamax on, on Jean Paul's side. So the Spectre will revert now. And because of those Electro Webs, it's, it's very vulnerable now to Inertiafu coming in and doing some big damage as well as that Moltres that, you know, has taken those drops as well. The Urshifu going to be able to potentially, if we see a Gigantamax here, could double up into the Moltres. It's so low health as well. There's probably no need to, but um, I think, like, you know, Jean-Paul in a position now where he has to make a decision. Does he just leave what he's got on the field? It makes sense to leave the Moltres because of the yawn, the sleep status there. Just allow that to go down. He's got some return on it, getting the, the, the knockout onto the Torkoal. But um, do you want to preserve your Spectre for later on this game because as i've mentioned before when the sun does disappear and uh, if the yoshifu doesn't lock into sucker punch then you've still got a way to uh, utilize it maybe later on in this game but at the cost of maybe sacrificing landris at the same time is it worth it it's, it's a very difficult situation and david's put himself in a great board position here yeah, he certainly has. And you can see the forfeit got locked in there really fast as well. But, I mean, the Venusaur being able to come in while the Sun was obviously up on the field set up by that tool call earlier on does put David in such a great position. He still had access to that Dynamax and particularly with the low health that that Moltres was on, if you set up the G-Max Vine Lash um, going into, say, the, spe the Spectria, then the residual damage is just going to be able to pick up the KO against that Moltres anyway. So really was such a dominant position from here. And, you know, what a contrast coming into that game too from David. Yeah, definitely. And it was all about taking down the Amoogus, you know, the, the support network that, that Jean-Paul relied on so heavily in that first game to disrupt with those spores and then obviously with the threat of redirection as well, you know. Um, the Amoogus mm -hmm. going down so quickly was like the cog that Jean-Paul relied on and without it, it became very difficult. He kind of went down a route where Dynamaxing the, the Spectre was his option and it didn't really work out for him too well because I think David did everything well in a, in a way where he was able to manage things with the electro web, the thunderbolt damage, and also utilize the talker with that yawn, which was very <laughs> pivotal in um, shutting down the Moltres and really locking that game out. Because, like I said, at that end point, you were kind of like, do you let both things go down? And then you've got a lone mm -hmm. Landorus, which is going to come in against the Dynamax Pokemon that you're probably not got enough to, you know, especially against an Urshifu and a, a G-Max Venusaur at that point. It's just a little bit too much. But uh, yeah, a total contrast from game one. And it'll, um, it's definitely heating up for game three because <laughs> I think there's... Obviously, Jean-Paul is now aware that, that that is an option for David mm -hmm. to get rid of the Amoongus. So he's going to be more aware of that. I don't think that he will allow that to happen again going into a, a game three and especially the game where everything is on the line. Oh, 100%. But I think David was really sort of showing off his mastery there. Like you said, preserving that Urshifu in the back for later on to apply pressure to Pokemon like the Spectria was really critical, getting that speed reset. And of course, the masterful play where he really covered all of his options there with the Electroweb and the Yawn combination from the Regieleki and the Torkoal. Just really made sure that he kept himself in that dominant position going into the game. But, you know... Reggie Gigas and Weezing have kind of been benched in games one and two, but let's jump into game three and see whether David is maybe going to shake things up dramatically, try and throw John Paul Lopez off his game, or if he's going to stick to the same strategy. There is going to be a change, however, from John Paul. Amoongus is still here, like you said, that pivotal cog in his team, but this time paired up with the Incineroar, allowing that Intimidate to go straight away onto that Urshifu um, and apply a little bit of fake-up pressure onto the field. David, however, sticking with the Reggie Alecki and Urshifu combination as his lead. Yeah, the, the inclusion now of Incineroar is really nice, not only for the Intimidate support onto the, the Urshifu, but like you say, Lou, the, the fake-out support that it provides Amoongus, it allows it the, the room to actually function like it did in that game one. It doesn't have to worry about a potential double up here, and it does make David, you know, react to that. So he's going to have to either take uh, uh, something going to sleep or switch out to kind of absorb maybe a potential spore coming in. Well, the Regieleki is going to have to take the fake out from the Incineroar. The Wicked Blow from the Urshifu once again targeting down into that Amoongus, but as there can be no double up thanks to the fake out, Urshifu will have to go back to sleep as it did in game one. But this time Urshifu hasn't taken any damage at the moment. 
No, no damage at the moment, and uh, but it is sleep. It is out of action, so it's not really going to be able to do uh, as much as what David wants. Um, and now you've got an op you've got the option here. If you're David, there's not really too much of an offensive threat in front of you. You know, the the Incineroar and the Amoongus aren't going to damage you too heavily. So do you take a few turns to try and and get the wake up, and then maybe utilize the Regieleki in the meantime? But you know, the Regieleki here is in an awkward position where it can get spoiled this next turn. So like we're saying, maybe Venusaur come onto the field here to soak that potential spore up. Yeah, and it gives Jean-Paul the nice option to potentially switch in the Landorus, but no, Amoongus just going to go for the Protect this time, doesn't want to retreat and set his regenerator ability up, just going to stay on the field for a little bit. Incineroar, however, going to be the Pokemon leaving the field and going for that parting shot into the Venusaur that's joined the field and going to be lowering a special attack by one stage, so the damage coming out from David's Venusaur will be limited going forward, but again from Jean-Paul's side, it's still the opportunity to potentially bring in that Landorus. You can apply another Intimidate to the Urshifu, rendering it really useless here on the field, and then once again apply the pressure of some Something like a max airstream into that Venusaur, but instead going to be bringing out the Spectria to the forefront. Yeah, interesting. I wonder if John Paul has actually brought the, the Landorus to this game, maybe sacrificing that and bringing the Incineroar instead, wanting to go down more of a Spectre route. And um, I think now, if you are uh, John Paul, you've got a couple of options where you can potentially switch your Mugus out, reactivate that regenerate ability, and get the, the fake out back onto the field. But it's risky because you're relying on the Ushifu staying asleep if you do that. Whereas if you keep the Mugus out on the field, then you know that you've got that redirection support for the Spectre, and you could maybe go for the Dynamax and go for some big damage and try and remove the Urshifu as quick as, as you can. Well, the Amoongus is going to leave and use its regenerator ability to get a little bit of HP before we see it again. Spectria, however, utilizing oh. its speed that it's got, you know, still intact this time, going for that Nasty Plot. We've seen Nasty Plot on so many Pokemon throughout this tournament, but on Spectria, I think that's a first for me there, Lee. Venusaur going to go for the Leaf Spawn, however, going to target down into the Spectria, do all just over about a third of damage and now reduce its special attack even further. I think it's going to be now at minus three. The Urshifu, of course, we saw was still sleeping there as well. Slightly unfortunate there for David. You know, some big damage, particularly with one on those critical hits will really do a lot of damage into that Spectria. Yeah, definitely. And the Venus all really like the mine is three now, you know, with its special attack, so it is gonna have to switch out. But the the, the, the inclusion getting the Incineroar onto the field for Jean Paul is really nice to uh, like attack into that Urshifu now because the thing is you've got the fake out support, even if it does wake up, you've got a way of kind of stopping it. So that is a really nice option. And then with the nasty pop boost now, that Spectre is gonna be hitting incredibly hard. So you can probably pick up a knockout with that combination fake out and and then a max move into the Urshifu. So that is something that, you know, David's going to have to be aware of as well if he wants to keep this Urshifu for later on. And as we're seeing, he is switching it out. Yeah, I like the way Jean-Paul has kind of counted around that Urshifu, you know, knowing that the sleep turns were ticking away. It had the opportunity to start waking up. So making sure that Fake Out was in the field to be able to protect the Spectria there was a really nice adjustment for him. But speaking of adjustments, David is really shaking things up on the field. We see Torkoal join and set up that Sunshine as Reggie Alecki joins. And Torkoal going to take that Fake Out that was intended for the Urshifu. Spectria, not Dynamaxing, whoever goes for the Mud Shot into the Torkoal. At plus two, it is not enough to be able to pick up the KO, but will reduce the speed of Torkoal. But we all know Torkoal doesn't mind that too much it's a nice and slow pokemon at the best of times and regains a little bit of hp with its citrus berry so a lot of board adjustments here for david yeah, and David making it the, the correct one, you know, he's got his Pokemon in pretty safely, especially the Regieleki, which is the Pokemon he probably wants on the field now to make use of that Electro Web that we've seen him use so well and successfully in, in previous games here. Going to be able to slow down that Spectre, which is such a big thing, you know, and um, <laughs> even if it goes down, then you've got the option to bring the Venusaur in and you're still going to have access to your Gigantamax Venusaur if that is the route that you want to go down. Obviously, the Talk All showing why it's such a good Pokemon, taking that big, nasty poop plot boosted attack there from the Spectria and not really caring about the speed drop either such a slow Pokemon but very strange play here from John Paul forced out with the Spectria and bringing in the Amoongus. Yeah, just removes the Spectre from play here. Doesn't want to take any potential speed drop. And another way to reduce the speed is by going for those Thunder Waves. And then you also get the additional chance of paralyzing your opponent. Amoongus is going to have to take that. A Snarl comes out from the Incineroar. So going to be lowering the special attack on both of these special attacking Pokemon. So Jean-Paul really trying to negate the offensive pressure that David has access to. But Torkoal not going to be going for any physical attack here. Going for another one of those Yawns into the Incineroar. Going to potentially force it to switch out. But being an Incineroar, it's known for kind of switching in and out of a battle so it can reset that intimidate and fake out and we know it has parting shot as well lee 
Yeah, so it's got the option now to, to pivot out and maybe allow John Paul to get something back onto the field. It's going to be a little bit more useful because of that sleep. You don't want your incineral going to sleep just yet. You need to keep active that fake out for later on in this game. The problem is now for the Amoongus that with that paralysis that we've seen from the Thunder Wave is it's actually going to underspeed the uh, the Torkoal. So it's not going to be able to hit it before it can take a big fire type attack. But not seeing that, just a very defensive play and a really good positioning play from David here. Yeah, well, the Reggie Alecki going for the protective view, calling that was going to be the target of the parting shot. So Incineroar will be forced to stay in on the field and go to sleep at the end of this turn. David, however, did manage to capitalize on that additionally by switching out the Torkoal for that Urshifu. So it's going to come back onto the field, have the potential to wake up and fire off a big damaging attack. Yeah, this is a really great play from, from David now because he's in a position where he's got time to allow the Urshifu to sit on the field until it wakes up and that's ideally what he wants, you know. He wants the Urshifu to wake up as soon as possible. Uh, the Amoongus can't utilize Spore as well if we see a switch to the Venusaur and that allows David again, the Venusaur on the field in the sun in a great position and not threatened currently by that Incineroar that is sleeping on the other side of the field. Well, Jean-Paul manages to switch it out and bring that Spectria back into the fray. Placing down against that Urshifu that is still going to be sleeping. So Spectria getting quite lucky and avoiding any of these Dark-type attacks. Venusaur, however, coming in to take that Spore and, of course, won't be affected due to being a Grass-type Pokemon. So definitely a lot of switches coming up from David here. But I wonder when the Dynamax is going to come into play here, Lee. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because as we've just seen on David's screen, that the, the sun will be running out this next turn, but the Urshifu has bound to wake up sooner or later, either the next turn or the turn after that. Um, I've lost, sorry, lost count of the sleep <laughs> turns here, but it is very close. It's been very tired, staying asleep. So, you know, it's not got long to wake up and it's not really in a threatened position at the minute. It's quite happy to stay on the field. And if the Venusaur decides to go for the Gigantamax here, it's a great opportunity to start getting some damage on the board. And you've got to be a little bit wary about the Spectre as well, but I don't feel like it's the time maybe that we're going to see that. Well, it is going to be the Dynamax here for David. Um, going to be that Venusaur jumping up into the action and being able to go for some of those G-Max Vine Lashes as well. So David's kind of bided his time here to a position where he can start dealing out some really big offensive pressure. And the lovely thing is he's got that tall call on the back. So even when the sun runs out, David just has the opportunity to be able to switch it in and reset that up to help Venusaur out a little bit more. Going to be going for the Max Quake though, boosting up the special defense on David's side of the field, going straight into that Incineroar. Not going to be enough to pick up the KO against it, but does a sizable chunk of damage. And I think being able to get the boost up here is going to help when facing down against that Spectre, particularly if it wants to try and go for a nasty plot boost. But instead, going straight for that Mud shot into the Urshifu that takes its first bit of damage in this game three having its speed reduced as well but it does finally manage to wake up the mud sort of shook it into action and it goes for that wicked blow finally able to find its target and go into that spectre and just remove it from the battle yeah and yeah, I mean, a really nice play here from for, for David and, and covering kind of a switch in from the Amoongus, suspecting maybe, you know, the Pokemon that you've seen so far, the one Pokemon that could come back in is that Incineroar and, and you know, just covering bases as well as kind of making sure that you've got a uh, special defense boosting. Here's that Spectre. It does go for the Max, uh, the Dynamax here because, you know, it hits so hard. So it's definitely a Pokemon you want to, you wanted like kind of cover with those big special attacks. So really nice play all around. We do see the Moltres come back onto the field uh, finally for, for John Paul, which gives them a good option to hit the, the Venusaur for good damage here. Yeah, really interesting to see that, as you said, Lee, he did not bring that Landorus. It's going to be the Moltres as his fourth and final Pokemon. So interesting though that John Paul doesn't have the utility to go for those max airstreams. Potentially the Venusaur can feel a little bit safer here um, in terms of its position. You know, it's at its full HP at the moment, but we saw how much that airstream did previously. But we know that Moltres can carry something like the Nasty Plot, and if it gets boosted up and David doesn't have a way to shut it down, then it can start dealing huge damage through David's team. But no Nasty Plot boost here. John Paul just wants to get into the Dynamax action as well, and Dynamax is up that Galarian Moltres. And Going for, you know, a lot of the sort of dark time moves it can deal out, it can start reducing the special defense, um, potentially rolling through with more max moves and dealing even more damage. But first of all, the max quake's gonna go into Incineroar and we know that's gonna be able to pick up the KO. And David really now playing around in the face of this Moltres, getting those special defense boosts up just to prepare itself to take a max move in return. Yeah, they're going to be so pivotal against the Moltres. You know, the, the one thing that it is good at is dishing out special attack damage and these special defensive boosts 
um, are going to be really, really important, especially for the Venusaur, you know. Um, the Urshifu going down, which is a little bit unfortunate, but because of that speed drop that it took from um, the mud shot off the Spectra, uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's a bad thing, though. It opens the door for you now, if you are David, to get the Torko back on the field and um, get make sure the Sun's up to support your, your Venusaur to really kind of maybe get a last attack off before um, Venusaur finishes its its, um, its Gigantamax turns in. You've also got the option here to go for another Max Quake if you want. Well, this is where things start to get really interesting. Um, if it goes for one more Max Quake, then it won't be able to set up the G-Max Vine Lash at all and get that residual damage going down onto the Moltres. But with Amoongus rejoining the field, Jean-Paul has the opportunity to go for something like a Rage Powder um, and redirect anything that Torkoal might be sending out. Venusaur still, however, can apply so much pressure to this Moltres um, by setting up that residual damage. But Moltres on the other side, going for those Max Airstreams, that's something Venusaur doesn't want to face. I believe it still has access to its Focus Sash, though, so that could put it into a really strong position here. Torkoal, however, just going for the protect here. Um, it's going to be another Max Quake, however, coming up from that Venusaur. Just going to target straight down into that Amoongus. Does a decent chunk of damage, but again, I think the critical thing here is getting those special defense boosts up in the face of this Moltres. I think this Venusaur is now at that plus three, thanks to the three Max Quakes that it has taken. Moltres going to go for that Max Airstream. Remember, it's not going to be boosted. And whoa, you can see the wow. benefit of having that special <laughs> defense boost there. Venusaur is delighted to take it. It could take another one, another two, maybe even three. <laughs> Definitely maybe three, I think. Um, yeah, really taking that very comfortably after those special defense boosts. Maybe not going to be the same kind of pitcher going into this next turn, but the thing is, the Venusaur we have seen on David, he does have access to that Sleep Powder, which can really, you know, on the other hand, you know, we've seen how that Amoongus really disrupted David's side of the field. Now the Venusaur, coins flipped, has got the option to really disrupt Jean-Paul's side, and especially disrupting in the middle of a, 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 t a turn where your Pokemon is Dynamax is really detrimental to you kind of getting any sort of grip on a match here so if that hits it's going to be really difficult for him to come back from well venus will go straight for the sleep powder into that moltres you know boosted up by the sun that the moltres hasn't been able to outspeed yet thanks to these max airstreams it just picks up the sleep on moltres talk going to follow up with the yawn but of course it's going to fail here on this occasion as amoongus goes for the spore so lots of sleep being thrown around but i do like the way that david did cover that just in case the sleep powder was going to miss onto that Moltres, having the 100% accurate spore, I'm um, sorry, the, the the yawn on there following up um, was just going to allow it to go to sleep on the following turn. Either way, David wanted to see it take a nap. Yeah, and it's a nice way to just, like you say, just cover that just in case, because Sleep Powder isn't the most accurate move. We've already seen it miss uh, in this in this set already. So, you know, just making sure if it does, then you're kind of covering bases with the Toll Call there. But not coming into play. The Moltres now finishes up its Dynamax turns and going to be in a bit of a, an awkward position because Imugus just doesn't have the, the damage output to hit the Venusaur, and the Venusaur pretty free to just um, dish out the damage. And Moltres, if it is relying on something like Hurricane, going to find it a lot more difficult uh, in the sun than it would in normal situations. Yeah, Amoongus definitely not going to be able to still any damage, but keeps getting paralyzed as well as we saw in that turn. So really not able to do anything remotely offensive to David's Pokemon here. And it really does look like David's in the driving seat here. He's got the control over the Amoongus and that Moltres as well, keeping it to sleep. And we know the Reggie Alecki in the back as well, with those powerful Electro-type attacks, will be able to deal really big damage to the Moltres. David just has to make sure that he gets it in a position where Reggie Alecki could be able to take that single KO. And it doesn't have to worry about taking a move from Moltres. Yeah, and I think if you are David, I think the one thing you might want to like concentrate down on, I know the biggest threat on the field is the Moltres, but if you can remove the Amoongus from the field, then at least you've got Reggie Alecki to come in as well and kind of help support this. Because uh, with those speed boosts, <laughs> when the sun runs out, Moltres is going to be hitting pretty hard. And uh, as you can see, it has just walk up and uh, been able to get those boosting moves in action. Yeah, getting the nasty plot off there as well makes Moltres really formidable. And Amoongus breaking through the paralysis this time and helping out its buddy, going for that pollen puff to help Moltres regain some HP. So Amoongus showing that it really is the most disruptive Pokemon here at the moment. And Torkoal staying asleep there for David. Um, obviously not going to be able to deal any of that. Those fire type moves that could potentially remove that Amoongus from play. You want to make sure as well if you're David, you're making the most of the sun, not only for the Venusaur, but to boost up fire type moves for that Torkoal as well. So it can deal as much damage as possible. 
Yeah, and the Torkoal really, you know, it, it is a sleep. It took the opportunity to double up onto the Moltres just in case the Sleep Powder did miss there. But that was an opportunity, I feel, where you could have maybe got a Fire-type attack off into the Amoongus to get some damage onto it. But unfortunately, that wasn't what happened. But, you know, David being smart here, making sure if the Sun does, you know, disappear, he's, he's switching in the option that he's got in the back in the Regieleki. So he's got the Sun to bring in again to make sure that that pressure is continually on and he's not losing an advantage here because the Moltres, unfortunately, if it is at speeding the Venusaur is going to be able to potentially pick up a knockout with those nasty pop blues even after the special defense boost that it has got and um, so being able to switch in the toll call you're kind of relying on maybe a sleep powder hitting here but if it mm. connects again it makes the battle a lot easier but the Amoongus like you've mentioned Lou is the the kind of the glue to this because with those pollen puffs as long as it's on the field and with access to spore it can just put the the supporting Pokemon for Venusaur to sleep and really stop them kind of functioning so that's something I think that Davina is going to have to concentrate down on at some point. Yeah, I and mean, this is really sensible and considerate play here from David. You know, he switched out the Torkoal knowing that the Sun was going to end at that turn. Now Venusaur's got the Sun activated again. It is the fastest thing on the field. Going for that Sleep Powder does, of course, connect onto the Moltres and is putting it to sleep once again. So just making sure that he's fully aware of the ball position and putting it in the way that he wants. Amoonga's still going to try and help out Moltres regaining itself, I believe now going up to full HP. But while it is sleeping, there's very little that it can do in terms of its offensive pressure. We know that it is Nasty Plot boosted as well, so David really does have to make sure that he can remove it from play. It might be a case though, as you mentioned, Lee, trying to remove that Amoongus and utilize those turns while Moltres is sleeping so that you can stop it for going for those pollen puffs and regaining that HP before you target down the Moltres. But there's always the risk that it could wake up. That is the risk, but I think this is maybe a golden opportunity here where you can potentially double into the Amoongus and remove it from the field and hope that the Moltres does stay asleep because um, what you're doing at the minute with the Moltres is you're getting damage onto it, but as long as the Amoongus sticks around on the field, it's just kind of overwriting that damage with those pollen puffs as we've seen, so it makes it very difficult to uh, to really get the damage onto it and kind of get rid of it like you're wanting to do and you're in this like never-ending cycle of having to get the talk all out for the, the Regieleki and to get the sun back on the field at certain points. Well, we've seen a lot of sleep turns in this game three, but Moltres is having none of it. Manages to wake up and go for that Fiery Wrath. Picks up the KO against Torkoal, so once the sun does go down on this set of Sunshine, it's not going to be able to be set up anymore by David, and he's forced to bring in his last Pokemon here, the Regieleki. So Venusaur, looking like it's got a little bit of health depleted here, um, needs to make sure that it's, you know, playing protectively making sure that it's making the most of the turns that it's got left because those fiery rafts are going to be dealing a lot of damage. Regieleki, however, could be the answer, targeting down into that Moltres. Amoongus potentially, though, could redirect away a powerful Thunderbolt. So Regieleki just going to be protecting itself here for David, wanting to make sure that the key Pokemon is not going to be KO'd, allowing Venusaur the opportunity to put that Moltres right back to sleep so Regieleki can have a happier time bouncing around on the battlefield, ready to fire off some electric-type attacks. Yeah, so that Sleep Powder here, really pivotal and getting the Regieleki in, protecting it as well, just sets up this next turn where you can potentially go for a Sludge Bomb from the Venusaur and then that Electro Web and just hope that it is enough because then, you know, the, the, the Venusaur is immune to the redirection from the Amoongus because of its Grass Typing and also the Electro Web is a, a double target attack, so it's not going to worry about being drawn in through a Rage Powder. But as we see, on oh. very unfortunate, the Amoongus is fully paralyzed. Yeah, not going to be able to Rage Powder away any Electro-type attacks. It's going to have to take the Sludge Bomb from the Venusaur. And you saw it actually did a huge chunk of damage to that Amoongus. Regieleki, however, able to capitalize and go into that Moltres and remove it from the field. You know, if he didn't want to double up into that Amoongus and remove it, decided to utilize the opportunity. And even if the Rage Powder had managed to redirect, it would have been able to, I think, pick up the KO against that Amoongus with the dwindled HP it had remaining. And then as long as Moltres stayed asleep, Regieleki could target it onto the next turn. But, I mean, really great play there by David, making sure that Regieleki was protected. You know, I'm always going to be a fan of anyone 